Hi, I'm Sean McVay, Director of Adult Faith Formation here at St. Joseph Catholic Church in Marion, Iowa. I want to welcome you to this part two in this series on the Old Testament, just trying to get a picture of what happened during the Old Testament time period. And let me just start by recapping a few key points from the last video, and then we're going to carry through to the time of Jesus in this video. So in the last video, we saw how Adam and Eve, God created them and the earth, they gave into temptation, fell into sin, sin entered the world. It was no longer possible for us to restore our relationship with God. We needed to be saved by God. So God immediately starts his plan of salvation. We see that humanity, you know, starts to turn away from God even more. And eventually he sends this flood to wash out those who were living in complete sin and he saves Noah and his family. So he does this cleansing through a flood, through water. And St. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that this prefigures baptism which saves us now. So we see from the earliest time in Scripture, God is revealing his plan on how he's going to save us. And he's doing it through the events that take place. So God makes a covenant with Noah and his family. This is a binding relationship. This covenant theme is what's going to carry us through. And I didn't say this before, but the word testament, when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, this word refers to the covenant relationship, the old covenant and the new covenant the reason why the Catholic Church used the, chose to use the word testament when naming these two halves of salvation history was because testament also involves the concept of the death of the testator for the will to be enforced. This is kind of referred to even in the book of Hebrews. So the theme, when we read scripture, we need to read it within the context of what are these covenants that God is making with us to save us. Starting with Noah, he makes this covenant, and he asks them, him and his family, be fruitful and multiply, the same command he gave to Adam and Eve after creating them. So, in a sense, God's recreating through this flood situation, starting over. Moving forward, we see this individual, Abraham. This is the person God chose to, to make a covenant with, and his descendants and they would be an example to the rest of humanity. And God's plan was to draw humanity to himself through the example of this chosen people. He makes a covenant with Abraham through circumcision. Well, there was a two-part element to this covenant. First, God swears himself to Abram, Abram by he had Abram cut these animals in half. God passes through them. And the, the message with that type of a forming of a covenant is, if I fail on my part, may my fate be like these animals. May I be cut in half. But then God asks Abram, Abraham, to do something as well, which was to circumcise himself and his whole family, which is a serious thing. And this is something that he would be reminded of daily. So we need to realize there's an element of sacrifice with forming covenants. When it comes to forming covenant relationship with God, there is sacrifice that takes place. What sacrifices is God calling you to make in your relationship with him in order to be faithful to him? At the time of Abraham, we also saw this interesting individual, Melchizedek, who was a both priest and king, and he gave gifts of bread and wine, and this prefigures Jesus. Here we are in the early stages of the book of Genesis, and we see this depiction of Jesus who was later going to be the priest king who would come to save us through offering the gift of himself, presenting it through the gifts of bread and wine. But he changes them into his body and blood. And he tells us that very directly at the Last Supper. This is my body. This is my blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. That takes us into the time of the Israelites. The... The descendants of Abraham came down to Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons through two wives and two concubines. Those would become the people of God. They end up in slavery in Egypt, as we saw. And the way that they were free from slavery was through celebrating the Passover meal. God commanded them to celebrate as a perpetual institution. They had to slaughter the unblemished male lamb. 
eat it with bread, unleavened bread, and sprinkle the blood over their doorposts. If they didn't do these things, the firstborn would die. The point God was making is this meal is so important. If you do not partake of it, you die. And then not only do they be, they're preserved from death, they're brought to freedom through the waters, through the Red Sea. God miraculously brings them through the waters and those waters wash away that which should enslave them. This symbolizes our plight with sin. Sin enslaves us. We can't be set free on our own. We need a Savior. Jesus Christ came to be that Savior. He is God who came, became man for our sake. And it's through the sacraments he's prefiguring here that he is going to save us. He washes away all sin through baptism. And he unites us to him through communion, the Eucharist. The food we eat literally becomes part of our being. And that is what is prefigured in these Old Testament symbols. If we don't eat the salvific meal, we remain a slave. We die in slavery. So that's where we're at. The, the Israelites have just come out of slavery. They're in the desert. They are headed to worship God at Mount Sinai. Now, one thing we need to observe here is that right away, God tests his people. God is going to test you and I. He's going to test us to see if we will trust in him, if we will place our faith in him. So they're in the desert. Imagine you are in the desert. It's not like it's lush with vegetation and food. And you've got all these people. And what are you going to do? What are you going to eat? God feeds them with this miraculous bread. And they didn't know what it was. They said, what is this? And the translation of that is manna. So they called this manna, which means what is it? God feeds him with this, but he says, look, only take enough for this day. Do not take enough for tomorrow or the next day, just today. And he did this to test if they would trust him. And if they took more than they needed, it would rot. But God would give them food the next day. He is beginning to teach them, you can trust me. What we begin to see from the people of God, though, is they are very easily discontent. They, they complain. So they eventually are complaining, hey, now we're going to die of thirst out here. So God miraculously gives them water through a rock. Imagine having enough water for all these people coming out of a rock. I mean, God is showing us that, hey, I can do whatever I need to do to take care of you. You just need to trust in me. So they reach Mount Sinai. God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. If you think about the sin that entered the world, the corruption that comes with sin, we are disordered. We can't just make decisions anymore based on our feelings because we are messed up. And people were making decisions based on the way they felt. Go back to Cain and Abel. Cain is jealous of Abel's sacrifice that he offered, so he kills him because he, he didn't like the way he felt, and so he killed his brother. So what we see is left to ourselves and left to our feelings and emotions, we don't necessarily make the right decisions. We need a roadmap to follow to help us when we feel a certain way and how do I make a good decision here? God gave them the Ten Commandments. Don't do these things. When you feel this way, you might want to do this, but it's wrong. And if you do this, you fall into slavery, into sin. If you don't do it, you remain free over here. But it's a challenge. Regardless, he gives them this roadmap. And this is what was going to set them apart even more. If they followed this path of life, they would stand out amongst all the nations. And that would appeal to them and they would want what Israel had. So at Mount Sinai, God ratifies his covenant with the Israelites. They build, he gives them the code of how to build the Ark of the Covenant. He commands that they build or they fashion golden angels to put on top of the Ark and to make images of cherubim all over the veil that would separate the Holy of Holies from the rest of the sanctuary. So the reason why God is commanding them to make these images is because in heaven where God is, he is surrounded by his angels. At this point in time, 
God, Jesus has not opened the gates of heaven to sinful humanity. So all you have there at this time in the Old Testament are angels. And God depicts angels at the holy place where he would communicate to all of humanity so that people would raise their hearts and minds to him in heaven. That was the purpose. At the same time, they're making priestly vestments. They're establishing this priesthood. Priests would offer sacrifice. Again, what we're seeing in this dynamic with humanity and our relationship with God is that we are called to offer sacrifice. We're called to offer God our best. Are you offering sacrifice in your walk with the Lord? That's something to ask yourself, where do I offer sacrifice? What we're gonna see later in RCIA is that the Catholic Mass is an offering of self in sacrifice. And it's, it's a liturgy. It's a work of the people with the work of the Lord. And that's what makes the Catholic Mass different than going to church anywhere else, is that we are entering into the sacrifice of Christ and offering our sacrifices that He will take them and give them to the Father. So this priestly component is important. What we see next, though, is that the Israelites sin against God. They become impatient. Moses goes up on the mountain to commune with God, to get direction. God, what do you want us to do? They become impatient and they pester Aaron and say, hey, this guy is taking too long. Let's make a God for us that we can worship it. Aaron kind of agrees to it and they give him all this gold. He fashions a golden calf and they worship the golden calf and say, here, here is your God that brought you out of Egypt. They wanted something they could feel and touch, something tangible. They didn't want to place their faith in God. They didn't want to place their trust in God, and that is where they went wrong. So they make this image and worship it as a God. Now, this is different than what God commanded them to do in fashioning the angels to represent what it's like for God in heaven in the holy place. They didn't worship those angels as God. They were used to raise their minds to God, and that's what God intended. Now here, God has to say, do not make idols for yourself. Do not make images of a God for yourself, because they worshiped it as God. Here I have in my hand a computer mouse. Now, if I was to fashion this and say, here is my God, this is what saves me from sin and death. Or I could take a piece of paper and print a picture on it and say, this piece of paper and this picture right here, this picture saves me. No, that's not what we're doing. That's not what Catholics do. When I look at this image, it's a depiction of Jesus. It helps raise my heart and my mind to God. This helps me picture what God looks like, because you know what? Jesus doesn't appear to me all the time. You know, He doesn't just show up and I get to look at His actual physical face, the one that He took on when He took on humanity. That doesn't happen for me. This helps me think of the Lord who saves me. This helps raise my mind to God. I'm not worshiping this image as a God. I'm not saying this piece of metal and this piece of wood right here that I'm touching is what saved me from sin and death. See, that's the difference. And unfortunately, a lot of people misunderstand that. And we got to remember that the devil is cunning. He's smarter than us. He takes our good intentions and our good desires and uses them against us to turn us away from our brothers and sisters in Christ, to turn us away from the path God is actually calling us. Some people think that it's a sin that I have these images here because they think this is an idol. But they don't really understand the difference between God calling us to use images to raise our minds to Him and worshiping something as a God. I, I think our, our modern intellect is too far advanced to be silly enough to worship this fashioned thing as a God. We need to look for our false gods, our idols, and other things. Is it materialism? Am I putting all my hope in money? If I just make enough money, I will be taken care of. That's the idol 
God is the one we need to put our trust and hope in. And let's look back at Israel now. Because they have committed this sin, there are ramifications to sin. What we see in the book of Leviticus is all these sort of rules and laws and sacrifice ordinances. And it's basically how to deal with this situation now. Coming out of Egypt, they worshipped images and things as a god, even animals. Here they, they fashion a calf and worship it as a god. So God's going to say, I'm going to make you slaughter so many of these that you're going to realize this is not a God over you. I'm going to make you slaughter so many calves that you're going to get sick of it. And it was to help them realize these animals, these images of animals are not gods. In fact, I have the ability to kill them. We don't have the ability to do anything to God like that. Now, to help you see what the point of all these sacrifices were that God was going to have them do, you need to put your mind into what it was like back then. So they depended on all their animals and livestock to live. They didn't have grocery stores. They couldn't just go buy a cellophane-wrapped package with meat in it and go cook it. No, they raised these animals. They fed them every day. Picture your pets. If any of you have pets that are watching, you're feeding that, you have a connection with this animal. Imagine having to kill that pet just so that you could survive. It, it is a painful reality that we have here in our earthly existence, and they were connected to that. I have to kill this animal so that I could live. Now picture this. If I commit a sin, if I commit this sin, I have to take this animal to the priest I have to claim the sin. I have to announce the sin, put my hands on this goat or whatever the animal is, say the sin, and then I have to slit the throat of this goat. And that priest then has to burn this goat on the altar to God. This is my offering to God and saying sorry for my sins. Now let's say I stole from my neighbor. I have to say theft, stealing from my neighbor and slaughter it. This is hurting me. This is hurting my life. Like, I need this to survive. Now I have to burn it, and I, now, I, now my resources are depleted. Is it going, am I going to be as likely to commit this sin next time? Next, we're going to move into the book of Numbers in our Old Testament time period. What we're going to see is because of this golden calf incident, only Aaron and the, the, the tribe of the Levites were, were the ones who would be the priests who would offer the sacrifices. God's original intention was that the firstborn of every family, of every tribe, would be the priests. So there's this special component to the firstborn that's always been kind of built into this culture for the Israelites. And we're going to see that moving forward. But the firstborn of every family was going to be the priests because they were unfaithful to God. Except for the Levites, they were the chosen ones to become the priests. We see that there are consequences for our choices to give in to sin. So they're wandering through the desert. They reach the promised land. They are, God is taking them to this land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants. He's taking them to this fertile land that they were to be given as a gift from God. And when they get there, they send out 12 spies, one from each tribe, and they go into the promised land and they come back with a report. Only two people out of the 12 believed they could take the promised land, Caleb and Joshua. Everyone else was like, no way, we cannot take this land. They were afraid. They didn't trust God. And as a punishment for still not trusting God, he's feeding them every day with this mysterious manna. He's bringing them from slavery to freedom. And then they still refuse to trust God. So he says, fine. This generation will pass away for not having trusted me. Again, consequence for sin. This isn't a free ride, guys. There are consequences to our sin and not trusting God. And so they wander in the desert for 40 years. Could you imagine spending 40 years in the desert till that whole generation passes away? Now it's time to enter the promised land. Moses himself, who is leading the charge this whole time, Moses passes away. The leadership goes to Joshua. Joshua, as you remember, was one of the two who believed they could take the promised land. So 
what we see, the first thing Joshua does is he renews the covenant relationship with God. Covenant is key. And it's mind-blowing to think they had so stopped living what God had asked while they wandered in the desert, they didn't bother to have their children circumcised. We see that even today with baptism. As we're going to see later on in the process, baptism is a requirement for salvation. People have not taken it seriously. It says directly in Scripture, unless you're born again of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will not be saved. Baptism is a key. If you look in the book of Acts, Peter gets up and speaks right at the beginning after Jesus was crucified, and everyone is cut to the heart, and they say, what must we do to be saved then? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Again, God prefigured baptism and the need for it back here in these Old Testament examples. And he's going to carry through with that and tell us how important it is. And I am getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I want you to see the connection. So coming back to Joshua in the desert, families had drifted away from God. They stopped entering into the covenant by doing the required circumcision. So... Joshua takes the time to renew the covenant. Everyone, no matter what your age was, male, you were circumcised. Once they recover from that, they go in and God wins the victory for them to take the promised land. But I want to point something out to you. Now, because of the hardness of heart and the jealousy and all the different greed, things like that, there was a fight over leadership and Aaron was challenged as the priest, the leader of the priestly class. And so they, they had to do this little test by, they, they took their, their shepherd staffs and they put them in with the Ark of the Covenant and whichever one budded by the morning would be the one who was chosen for the priesthood. Aaron's staff was chosen, it flowered and budded and everything. And so everyone else was, was essentially humbled and God showed Aaron was the chosen one. So then in the Ark of the Covenant, they put Aaron's staff, they put the Ten Commandments and manna. These things would prefigure Jesus. Jesus is the great high priest represented by the, the staff of Aaron. He feeds us with his body, which is prefigured by the manna in the desert, the bread of life. And the Ten Commandments are the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. So in the Ark of the Covenant, we have this depiction of Jesus traveling with them throughout their time in the desert. This is going to prefigure Jesus, and the Ark prefigures Mary, the one who would carry the Word of God in her body and give birth to our Lord. Now, while they're in this desert experience, they grumble, they, they continue to grumble against God. And so at one point they grumbled and they were bit by serpents for their grumbling. Punishment for their sins. So there's consequences to our choices here. And so the way that God would save them from these snake bites is they had them fashion an image of a serpent, raise it up on a pole, and they had to look at it. Now, they're not, at this time, they're not worshiping the serpent as a god. They were told by God to make this image so that they could be healed by God through it. And so, again, we see this difference between God commanding them to make an image for a purpose and making an image to worship as a false god. So, again, they were to look at the serpent to be healed by God. We look at these images to raise our mind to God. You've got to see that difference. It's crucial in understanding what God's plan is in our salvation. Now, one thing I want to interject, you know, as this whole process of them going in and taking over Jericho, they sent spies in to, to search out the city. And they were helped by a prostitute named Rahab. Now, the reason I want to point, I want to point out Rahab is she's not from the Israelite tribe. She's not an Israelite and she's a prostitute. But Rahab helps them and they, they, they preserve her and her family. They save her and they're supposed to kill everybody else. 
Well, Rahab ends up becoming part of the lineage of the Savior of the world, Jesus. Here you have a non-Israelite and a prostitute who is an ancestor of Jesus. And we're going to see this kind of a theme as we go through the Old Testament. God chooses people like this. And I think one of the reasons is that he wants to show us I can work with sinful humanity. I can work with anyone and I include everyone. Yes, the Israelites are my chosen people, but my plan for salvation involves everyone. I want to save everyone and I want to work with everyone to save others. So God wins the battle of Jericho. But again, we see this lack of faithfulness on behalf of the Israelites. God told them that they basically had to wipe out all of the, the nations that they came to. First they took over Jericho, but then they had to continue their campaign to take out all these other cities and civilizations. Now we might look at that and think, oh, that's awful that God would make them slaughter all these innocent people. The reason why God had to do this is because of the hardness of their heart and their inability to remain faithful at this time. He basically needed to clear the floor out so that they could learn how to trust God and get strong in that. So then later on, when other nations are reintroduced, they have the strength to remain faithful to God, remain a witness on God's behalf that would attract these other nations. The problem with Israel was every time they would get with one of these other nations, they would end up taking on the false gods and the practices of these cultures. And that's what ends up happening. They weren't faithful. They didn't wipe out all of them. They let some of them stay and they end up giving into idolatry. They stopped being faithful to God. And again, they didn't place all of their trust in God. This is the recurring problem with Israel. So what ends up happening is that God has to send judges to help bring the people back throughout this time period. You see, God was supposed to be their leader, but they began to look to other nations and worldly things as their leadership, and they began to do the things that these other nations would do. So God would send the judge, which was actually more of a military leader. It wasn't a judge like who would sit in a court. It was basically God would send a military leader to help get the people back to God. There were 12 judges throughout this time period. There was even a woman who was a judge. And one of the most well-known judges was the last one, Samson. The situation with Samson was he had this unbelievable strength and he could lead Israel in victory over all of their enemies. So the Philistines were one of their key enemies throughout this time period and the Philistines sent this girl Delilah, who Samson had this attraction to, and they tried to use her to find out what's the source of his strength so we can take it away so that we can beat Israel. So she's asking Samson, you know, what's your source of strength? And he would tell her a reason like, oh, uh, ropes. If, some, if I'm tied up with ropes, I lose my strength. So she ties him up with ropes to test it and says, Samson, Samson, the, the Philistines are coming. And and he breaks the ropes, and so she sees that it was a lie. He wasn't being honest with her, so that wasn't it. So she keeps working on him, trying to find out what is the reason. And this is a story that is also supposed to give us this image of when we flirt with sin. If we allow it to stay around, it's eventually going to get us, most likely. And that's what happens to Samson. Eventually, he admits to her that the real reason or the, the, purpose, the source of his strength is his long hair. So when he falls asleep, she cuts his hair off. And she wakes him up. Oh, the Philistines are coming. He doesn't have the strength to, to save himself or Israel anymore. And he's put in prison. And this is an example of us giving in to the temptation and committing the sin. We lose our spiritual strength. And so one of the nice things about this story, though, is that over time, slowly, Samson begins to regain some of his strength as his hair grows back. So after we have been hurt by giving into sin, we can slowly work back to being reconciled 
and made whole again and get our spiritual strength back, but it can take a little while. It may not be overnight. It might not be like the click of a finger. So at the end of this period of the judges, we see this clear movement of the people. They want a king to rule over them like all the other nations have. Again, they wanted something they could touch and, and physically uh, you know, see in order to trust God, in order to believe that God was their leader. They wanted to be like other people even. And so God says, all right, if you want an earthly king, he's going to make your men serve in his armies. He's going to charge you taxes. He's going to do all this stuff. But if that's what you want, I'll let you have it. And so we see God appoint the first king over Israel, and his name was Saul. Before I get into this period of kings with Israel, I just want to pause for a minute and just develop something that I pointed out before. We're going to go all the way back to Judah for a minute. He was the son of Leah, and he was, he was a little bit of a shady character. If you remember, he ends up sleeping with his daughter-in-law when he thought she was a prostitute, and they end up having a son named Perez. And it's through that line that we're going to travel down ultimately to Jesus. I want to point out another one, though. Boaz and Ruth. Now, Ruth was a Moabite. She wasn't an Israelite. What happened was her mother-in-law, Naomi, that her and her husband and sons moved to Moab. And their sons married Moabite women. Naomi's husband died and her sons died. So now she has, it's Ruth and her two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth. And Naomi says to her daughter-in-laws, hey, just go back to your own people. You know, I'll, I'll be okay, whatever. Just go find somebody to remarry, whatever. So uh, Orpah goes back to her people, but Ruth says, no, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to help take care of you. And so Naomi says, well, I'm going to go back to my homeland, my, my Israelite people. So they travel back and Naomi sends Ruth to pick grain in the field, which was their custom to, for widows to be able to come pick the grain that was left over at harvest time. So Ruth is out there picking grain in Boaz's field. And ultimately, Ruth and Boaz get married and they have a son Obed. The point is, once again, we see that God is working with other nations and he would come to be the savior of the world through these other nations as well. So we have a Moabite woman who's going to be in the line and this is just something for us to remember. Now, Ruth and Boaz have the son Obed Obed has a son named Jesse, and Jesse has a son named David. David is the key figure in this Old Testament story for the Israelite people. So now let me get back to Saul for a minute. God appoints Saul as the first king. He had some military success at the onset, but he also was impatient and didn't wait or trust in God. He didn't wait for God's plan, and he didn't trust in God. So Samuel had to come and anoint him as king, and he was impatient, so he anointed himself. He took on the role of the priesthood for himself, and this was an offense against God. This was essentially the beginning of the end for Saul. So Jesse has many sons, actually. David's one of the, David's the youngest. God sends Samuel to anoint the next king. Because Saul had, you know, basically turned away from God and his plan. So he sent to Jesse's house. He sees all of his sons. David's out in the fields shepherding the sheep. He sees the other sons and he says, God hasn't chosen any of these. Is there any other ones? And they, they say, yes, David. So they send for David. He's the one who's anointed as king. And soon after that, we're in a situation where the Philistines come against the Israelites in war. Everyone's afraid. The Philistines have this giant named Goliath, and Goliath makes this charge and says, hey, let's have a man-to-man -man fight, and whoever wins, 
this man-to-man -man fight, their army wins. No sense in, in thousands of people dying. Now everyone's afraid to fight Goliath because he's enormous. So David goes to visit his brothers who are in the army and he sees everyone afraid. He's like, what's wrong with you people? We are the children of the covenant. We are the chosen people of God. God will win this fight for us. Can you see his trust in God? Here he is, a young boy. And, and they, they say, okay, he's, he says, I will fight Goliath. And so he goes out against Goliath and all he has is a slingshot. But he knew God would give victory because when he was out shepherding the sheep, he had to fight, fight vicious animals and overcome them to, to protect the sheep. God, he knew God would help him have victory just as he has before. So David gets his slingshot and hits Goliath right in the head with a stone and takes him out. David wins and everyone becomes enthralled with David. And so much so that eventually Saul becomes very jealous of David. David's running for his life. Ultimately in the end though, after Saul dies, David becomes king of Judah which is the, the tribes in the southern part of the kingdom. And there was 10 tribes in the northern part of the kingdom. And ultimately, David becomes king of the entire kingdom. He unites all of Israel. It was the united kingdom. So this was a glorious time for the Israelites. David's this great king. They're gaining more territory. And God makes a promise to David that it would be his descendant who would sit on his throne forever. So this becomes the promise that all of Israel locks onto and will carry to the time of Jesus. This is a major deal. Although David had a heart for the Lord and was chosen by God, he still fell into sin. Now, when they were at war, it was their custom for everyone to abstain from any sexual activity. During a time of war, usually the king would go out to war, but in this scenario, David stays behind. He's getting a little lax here. He stays behind and he sees this beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba. And he's like, hey, hey, who's this? You know, so he ends up calling for Bathsheba. They end up having an adulterous relationship because she's married and her husband's out fighting in the war. Turns out Bathsheba becomes pregnant. So now David is going to try to cover up his sin. He brings Uriah, the Hittite, her husband, home and he, he parties, he gets them all drunk, and he tries to get him to go sleep with his wife. So then it wouldn't look like this, the child was from anyone other than her husband. But Uriah refuses. He sleeps on the doorstep of David's castle there. And he's, he's being faithful to the king and to the practice of the people. Ultimately, David can't get him to go home. So he puts him back into the, into the army and has him put on the front line and has them pull their people back so he gets killed. So he has Uriah the Hittite killed because of his own sin. Sin is leading to greater sin. So David brings Bathsheba into the castle and marries her, and they have this child, but God punishes them. And he sends Nathan the prophet to help him realize, you have sinned. David repents, he fasts and everything, asking for God to spare the life of the child, but the consequence is the child dies. God's not doing this to be vicious, but to help us realize when we sin, we can't do that. It hurts us and everyone else. Remember, death is the consequence of sin. And this is an example of that. In our world today, sometimes we get comfortable and think, oh, there's no real consequence. I can do this. I can commit adultery. I can have an affair, whatever. People live that way because they don't see the consequences. There are plenty of consequences that are going on in our world. This people don't have any faith, so they don't see that this is the consequence for their sin. And even if we don't see the consequences now, it will become clear to us when we stand before God in judgment. We want to live the right way now. So that when we stand before God in judgment, we realize, I did my best for you, Lord. I see that. I see where I still failed, but I need you to be my Savior. And if we don't live our lives for the Lord, we don't develop that relationship where we can turn to him in our hour of need. 
Well, David and Bathsheba have another son named Solomon. So David had many wives and many children. But I want to point out that it was through an adulterous relationship that God ultimately brought the next person in the lineage toward the Savior. I'm not glorifying adultery uh, at all. It's not okay. We shouldn't do that. But God can still work within our broken humanity. He reminds us, look, this is wrong and there will be consequences. But even if you do wrong, that doesn't mean I abandon you. In fact, I will still be with you. I will make my plan work with whatever you give me. And in this situation, it's Solomon who takes the throne after David dies. Solomon has this prosperous United Kingdom as well, but the people begin to get strained by his rule. And one of the problems with Solomon is he had, he would make, although he asked for the gift of wisdom from God and was very wise, he also took on a worldly wisdom, which wasn't efficacious in his relationship with God. So he began to intermarry with all of these nations to, to join, have a pact with them. So he would take a wife from this nation and this nation and this. He had all these wives from other nations and he brought into his house their false gods as well. And so he's like, sure, you can have a, an, an altar set up to your God. You can have an altar set up to your God. And eventually, after all these years of this, the true God's one place in his life just became equal to all these other false gods. So he took the one true God and put him down here on the same playing field as all these false gods. And this was leading them toward another rupture in the relationship with God. So there's all these false altars set up throughout the kingdom. There's all this idol worship going on in the kingdom now because of bringing all these other nations into Israel. And what happens is his son Rehoboam takes the throne after he dies. He's very young and he says to the older people who were advisors to his father Solomon, you know, what, what do you think I should do? And they said, you really got to lighten up on the taxation on the people. The people are just strained because Solomon taxed him heavily to, great, to make this great kingdom, to, to build this wonderful temple to the Lord. And so then he turns to his younger people his age and says, okay, what do you guys think I should do? And they're like, you need to show these people who's boss. You need to tax them even more. So Rehoboam increases the tax. And this just breaks the people in a sense. They're like, we're done. So the 10 tribes in the north essentially defect. They follow a man named Jeroboam and they are no longer part of this kingship that was established by God and would ultimately lead to Jesus. So the two tribes in the south in Jerusalem became known as Judah. And then the 10 tribes in the north followed Jeroboam. And from that point on, the tribes in the north and their kings fall away from God. They set up false altars. They set up a false priesthood so that they wouldn't have to go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice. And again, their whole relationship with God, their whole religion revolved around offering sacrifice. And it had to be the way God asked them to make sacrifice. And God commanded that the sacrifice take place in Jerusalem. So when they weren't faithful to that, they were not being faithful to what God said they needed to do in his plan for salvation. So over the years, the, the northern kingdom eventually gets beaten by other nations and thrown into exile. So the northern kingdom went into exile around 722 BC. The southern kingdom in Judah, they became known as the Jews and they lasted a little bit longer. Their exile, they had a three phase exile and started in the year 605 BC. But the reason why they were sent into exile is because they were not being faithful to their call to forgive. See, God had forgiven them so many times. So many times they turned away from God. 
He forgave them. He actually heard their cry all the way back when they were in Egypt and set them free. And part of the example God wanted them to set for the world was that he forgives and sets free. They were supposed to forgive the people of their debts every seven years, a Jubilee year. And they weren't doing that. They would say, oh, I forgive your debts, but then they would immediately re-indebt them as soon as they said, we forgive you, which is not the example and not what God asks of them. And so for that reason, they were put into exile for not being faithful to the witness God was calling them to. Now they're in exile for 70 years in Babylon. Now, one of the reasons this is very significant is it takes them away from their very identity as the people of God. Their, their identity revolved around the temple sacrifices and their priesthood. When, and it had to be in Jerusalem. By exiling them, they were not able to make any sacrifices whatsoever according to their custom and code that God had given them. So in the time of exile, they held on to the word of God because that's all they had left. And they see, you see the development of synagogues and their focus was on studying the word and the preaching of the word. But eventually, after this 70 year period, their exile period was ended and they were allowed to go back to their homeland, to Jerusalem, which was the hub and center of their faith. Now, at, in conjunction with all this, the northern tribes were also freed from exile. But by this point, what's essentially happened is they've been absorbed into other cultures. So they, most of them were sent into exile and they began to become one with those cultures. And the ones that were remaining, they brought other cultures in and they intermarried. And so their faith is very watered out. They, they, they practice other idolatry type practices. They've incorporated other gods again. And the, the people who were moved out of the northern kingdom, they just became comfortable where they were at. They're like, yeah, we're just going to stay here. So you didn't see that a clear identity of the northern kingdom anymore. But when the southern kingdom came back, they came back to Jerusalem and they were enabled to come back because King Cyrus, the Persian, granted them this freedom. He said, I've been chosen by God to do this. And it was a really neat situation. And he helped them. He even provided provisions for them to go back and reestablish their re religion. So the first wave of the return happened in 538 BC, led by Zerubbabel. And when he returned, he rebuilt the temple. He restored the temple. That was the first thing that needed to be done because all of their sacrifices revolved around that temple. That needed to be the first thing. The second wave of the return was in 525 and, and through 457 BC. And in that wave, they, they reestablished Jerusalem and Ezra read to them from the book of the law, which was the first five books of the Bible, and he called for a return to ritual purity. You see, they had intermarried with other nations, and he's saying, nope, we need to, we need to pull back, and we need to just reestablish ourselves with the Lord. So people who were married with people from other nations were asked to essentially give up those relationships and it's not that God didn't care about those other people, but once again, because of their inability to remain faithful to the teachings that God had given them, he basically said, look, you need to be, once again, separated from these nations with false gods until you get strengthened, and then we can readdress that. And in the third wave of the return, around 444 BC, Nehemiah comes back and he rebuilds the walls of, Re of Jerusalem, basically refortifying the city, making it strong again. And he led the people to confess their sins and make a binding agreement with God, renew the oath, the covenant. So we see the people trying to get back to their center of worship, their center of sacrifice, and be, renew themselves in being faithful to what God had called them to and their covenant relationship with him. So then we kind of move into, in the storyline, we're in the book of Maccabees now, the first book of Maccabees, and we see that they had some prosperity. Things went pretty well for a while, but they still didn't have a king from the line of David. And eventually, they were getting persecuted by other nations, 
and Judas Maccabeus and his sons lead a revolt. And ultimately, this resulted in a purification of the temple. And this celebration in the, in the purification of the temple was, became known as Hanukkah, the, the Feast of Lights. And they still celebrate this to this day. But this kind of enacts the period of the Hasmonean dynasty. Basically, the people from the family of the Maccabees, they're not from the line of David. But they kind of take rule and they also kind of take over the priesthood. So they they're, take over the kingship and the priesthood and they're moving forward in time. But, you know, it's still not the great kingdom of Israel that they longed for. The north was still separated. They were just a small unit in the south. And the people longed for the return of the line of David, the one who would sit on his throne forever and reunite the kingdom and bring a strong kingdom again like they once had under David. During this time, civil war broke out between the Sadducees who favored Hellenization and the Pharisees who favored an observance to the Torah. And around 63 BC, Pompey killed the priests at their duties and made Harkonnes II high priest. This brought an end to the Hasmonean rule in 37 BC. And Herod the Great was made the king of the Jews. Again, Herod is not from the line of David. Essentially, the Jews became captive in their own land. They were awaiting the coming of the Messiah from the line of David to restore Israel and unite the kingdom and free them from the Roman authority. This leads up to the time of Jesus where you have a people who are longing for this great kingdom to be restored for Israel. They want all 12 tribes to be reunited. They want to have this wonderful kingdom once again like they had under David. And they just knew that God had promised it and they were waiting for it. And soon Jesus would come and he would fulfill all of what he prefigured in the Old Testament in his plan for salvation. The plan that culminates in the sacraments as we are going to see throughout this process in our CIA. So Jesus is going to establish baptism. He's going to establish the Eucharist. We're going to see the celebration of what we now call confirmation, which was the laying on of hands where people would receive the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We see that happening in the book of Acts. We also see other sacraments being instituted, like the, the priesthood is instituted. Jesus didn't just come and hand us a book and say, here, read this book and you'll get it figured out. Jesus came and chose 12 men to put over as the leadership of his church. They would have a sacramental ministry. They would preach the word and administer these sacraments that he commanded them and others, such as even going to confession. Jesus talks about in the Gospel of John chapter 20. And we're going to talk about all of these sacraments and how God instituted them later on in this process. I look forward to getting to that point with you, but before we get there, we have a lot of other things I want to share and my team, we're going to share with you. So I hope you will stay tuned to this whole series. And eventually, I hope that if you're not already Catholic, you will see these truths and want them for yourself. Until then, take care and God bless.